Well, good evening. I want to welcome everybody to our kickoff event for um, our celebration of women in the STEM fields. And of course, you probably know that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This is the second such celebration that we've had here at Community College. The first was a celebration of women in the arts. That was three years ago. Um, it's part of our celebration of Women's History Month. And uh, uh, we organized this as part of uh, the Feminist Reading Group and the Women's Studies Program here on campus. Uh, the purpose of it is for our community to explore the role of women in these fields, both in the past and today. I want to um, thank the people here at the college for supporting gender equity, which our college has done through its entire history. Particular thanks to Provost Gilda, Hilda Gil Healy for her early support of this event, along with uh, the support of Dr. Patty Trepkowski, Dean of Instructional Support and Interdisciplinary Studies. Dr. Lori uh, Chesley, who's the Associate Dean of Arts and Sciences, and also our Dean Rick Olson. Uh, this evening, um, we're very fortunate to have with us as our first speaker, Dr. Carolyn Shapiro Shapin, who's Associate Professor of History from Grand Valley State University, from their history department. Dr. Sha uh, Shapiro Shapin earned her degrees, her Bachelor of Arts degree at Adelphi University, her Master of Arts and her PhD at Yale University, and all of those degrees were in history. Um, I am very happy to introduce to you now Dr. Carolyn Shapiro Shapin um, as she gives us her presentation on research in unlikely places, Pearl Kendrick, Grace Eldering, and the Michigan Department of Health Laboratories. Thank you very much and good evening. In February of 1932, Michigan Department of Health bacteriologist Pearl Kendrick wrote to Cy Young, Director of Laboratories for the Michigan Department of Health, requesting permission to develop a pertussis or whooping cough vaccine in the state laboratory in Grand Rapids. Young replied tongue in cheek, go ahead and do all you can with pertussis if it amuses you. The pertussis studies performed by Kendrick and her research partner Grace Eldering quickly bore fruit. At the American Public Health Association's annual meeting in Milwaukee in 1935, Kendrick reported that preliminary data from the Grand Rapids field test showed remarkably fewer cases of pertussis in the, among the group of vaccinated children as compared with the control group. By 1942, the vaccine was widely accepted and widely distributed. Michigan Department of Health scientists had, working on a limited and often dwindling budget, um, and in cramped laboratories skillfully balanced an ever-growing burden of routine analysis with an innovative research agenda that drew the attention of health authorities from around the world. This evening I will discuss the way that, ways that Kendrick and Eldring's pertussis studies shed light on the pre-World War II scientific enterprise. First, their pertussis studies offer historians a case study for examining the nature of research support during the interwar years. Second, their research points out the importance of the State Department of Health Laboratory as a research venue. Finally, their studies invite historians to see the inherent value of routine analysis to the larger uh, research enterprise. Today, scientists enjoy funding from an alphabet soup of federal agencies, private foundations, research institutes, and universities. Between 1920 and 1940, scientists had far fewer options. The federal government supported studies designed to facilitate military ventures, trade, quarantines, and after the creation of the Children's Bureau in 1918, a range of maternal child health studies. Many national and international projects receive Rockefeller Foundation support. 
Despite health public, public health advocates' calls for increased funding for this kind of public health research, however, scientists were often forced to assemble funds from diverse sources. Kendrick and Eldering's laboratory report, uh, laboratory work, and concerted outreach efforts won them the cooperation, confidence, and community support, financial and otherwise, that made the large-scale field trials possible. In 1932, shortly after she was named Associate Director of Laboratories and Chief of the Grand Rapids Branch Laboratory, Kendrick initiated the whooping cough bacillus research, an effort that actually coincided with state efforts to cut the budget. The Department of Health gave Kendrick and Eldring the freedom to use the state's laboratory facilities to conduct their innovative research once the day's regular analyses of water and milk from most of the western part of the state were done. And Grand Rapids is actually was chosen for the Western Branch Laboratory because it's at a railroad crossroads, and also you can get river traffic down, so it was, it, it was well connected. As Eldering recalled in a 1984 interview, when the workday was over, we started on research because it was fun. We'd come home, feed the dogs, get some dinner, and get back to what was interesting. This research, however, as Eldering makes clear, was often done on their own time and often on shoestring budgets cobbled together from private donors, city coffers, and only later state funds. And after that, when um, the federal government starts sending New Deal relief funds, state emergency relief funds pay for some of their staff and then later federal emergency relief funds. But before 1935, they were working in the hundreds of dollars for their budget, which if you compare that with modern scientific budgets today, which are often in the millions of dollars, um, it's quite a contrast. Kendrick and Eldring were fortunate to live and work in Grand Rapids, Michigan, a city dedicated to preserving the health of its citizens. Grand Rapids consistently achieved high honors from the American Public Health Association and the Interchamber Health Division of the Chamber of Commerce of the U.S. And from 1932 to 35, um, they basically were repeatedly cited for excellence, and in 1931, they actually win the Healthiest City Award. And this um, Kendrick and Eldring's research actually helps contribute to that award. The city would continue to receive honors throughout the 1930s. Kendrick and Eldring forged solid, mutually beneficial working relationships with Grand Rapids physicians, relationships that were integral to the research process. Early in 1933, Kendrick's laboratory began supplying pertussis vaccine to Dr. Leon DeVell, a local doctor and vice president of the Ann Arbor Pediatric Society. Other doctors, including L.J. Skammerhorn, began requesting vaccines soon after. Rather than handling each request on the basis of an autogenous vaccine, in other words, vaccine created from a person's own germs, fixed around, and put back into the person, they said, can we get some funds so that we can make more efficiently make a supply from several local pertussis strains? Kendrick then asked Cy Young, may we do this on an experimental basis, supplying these few pediatricians who are the type to cooperate as to records? In return for providing vaccines, Dr. DeVell supported laboratory work by spreading news to the medical personnel at St. Mary's Hospital and other facilities that um, diagnostic cough plates would be available. As the Bureau of Laboratories noted in its 1934 report, the close association between the West Michigan Department and the health work of the city makes, particularly advantageous, um, makes a particularly advantageous arrangement for all of us. The possibilities for cooperative investigation, they continued, um, is unlimited. Such an investigation is in progress at the present time in connection with a pertussis study. The next step for Kendrick and Eldering in creating a general vaccine was to take what work had been done and make it more efficient and more effective. To this point, they had his, his scientists had isolated the bacillus that causes whooping cough and argued a great deal over whether it was really the one, figured out that if you use smooth cultures rather than the rough phase of the culture, you got a better vaccine. And some scientists, Modson and Sauer, had actually had very limited vaccine studies. Kendrick and Eldering will modify the Sauer studies, make the vaccines more potent, make them safer by doing a cold kill and leaving it in the fridge for a week. 
and then doing a safety test in their own arms. In other words, they would actually inject each other with each batch of the vaccine to make sure that no children would die. Now, where did they get the samples to do all of this work? Well, at first, they had a good connection with the city physician, and he would give them a call, and they, they lived up on Bayberry on the northwest side, which if you've been up there is a fairly steep hill. So they parked their standard shift car facing down the hill so they could roll into gear, dash off, put the cough plate in front of the children's faces, collect the cough plate, take it back to the lab, analyze it, and do what they needed to do. By 1934, they also had 22 physicians, three bacteriologists, 20 visiting nurses, and a number of mothers going around and collecting cough plates for them. And that's where they're going to get their sample material. From these samples, they created a more potent, more consistent vaccine with strict cr criteria for selecting organisms. And they then wanted to compare these vaccines they created with organisms used in other well-studied cultures. Now, a word about growing Bordetella pertussis. It's a f what's known as a fastidious organism, or in layman's terms, a persnickety bacillus. It only grows under very exacting media and temperature requirements. And I'll speak more about creating a cough plate medium at the end of this paper. But just understand that we talk about, well, they just grew the bacillus. That was actually a very difficult procedure. Later on in their career, Kendrick and Eldring would, from the vaccine, describe, um, develop a standard potency test. Working with NIH scientists, they would develop measures to figure out how many organisms were actually in a sample. And their vaccine, while it's no longer used today because we've gone to an acellular pertussis vaccine, if you go over to um, NIH and talk to the scientists who work on pertussis, they will tell you that Kendrick and Eldring's vaccine was among the best made and one of the least reactive. Pertussis vaccines tend to actually be fairly reactive. Now, once you produce the vaccine, you then need to do a field test. Vaccines have to go through field trials to be put into general use, and that means testing the vaccine in children. Here, Michigan's, Departments of Health, um, Michigan's Department of Health uh, was amazingly good at outreach not just to individuals, but to local organizations. During this time period, early 20th century and beyond, many vaccine studies relied upon orphans. Orphans were the ones who were called, in, called upon to, quote, do their duty to society because, well, they had to pay the debt back somehow. Eleanor Roosevelt in 1933 began investigating claims of orphans used in research, and she will eventually help terminate that practice. Kendrick and Eldering did not rely on orphans. Instead, they addressed the Community Health Service, the City Health Department, the Kent County Medical Society, the local PTAs, the Visiting Nurse Association, the Board of Ed, the Chamber of Commerce, and even the League of Women Voters. The goal here is get the vaccine study known, and build trust in the community. These community groups would first support a preschool immunization survey. Before you can do a vaccine study, you have to know who's had pertussis, who's had the shots of any kind of shot, and then you need to match the children who are going to receive the vaccine with controls for who are the same age, the same sex, the same living district, living conditions. So this preschool immunization survey created, um, funded with State Emergency Relief Administration funds, i.e. federal dollars given in block grants to the state during the New Deal, provided Kendrick and Eldring with a viable means of selecting controls matched for age, sex, and district. The parents willingly brought in their children for vaccines. Whooping cough is a disease that most Americans no longer know about. Senior citizens know about it. Um, and unfortunately, some pediatricians are knowing about it because parents aren't vaccinating. But basically, the reason the disease was so deadly, especially in the under five age group, was that it causes a child to cough himself into what we'd call shaken baby syndrome. It is a horrible disease. It takes weeks and weeks to get over the disease. Um, 
Both Kendrick and Eldring had suffered from the disease as children. They remembered it well. They didn't want anyone else to ever suffer from it. Then you have to get, so once you get children to do the study, then you have to administer the vaccines. And here they set up clinics in federally funded nursery schools, city hall, local schools, and they had to give the children a series of four or five shots. Then they had to have the visiting nurses follow up. Who got whooping cough? Who didn't get whooping cough? Who was actually exposed to whooping cough and got it? Who was exposed but didn't get it? Speaking in 1936 to the American Public Health Association, Kendrick noted that they could not praise too highly the Bureau of Public Health Nursing's outreach and follow-up work. The initial study involved about 1,500 children, 712 vaccinated, 880 controls. And the results are dramatic. Although they always modest, they cautioned against giving the numbers too much weight in the face of the relatively small number of whooping cough cases. Of the 712 children given the vaccine, only four got whooping cough and they had mild cases. But of the 880 controls, 45 got whooping cough. 90% of the children exposed in the unvaccinated group got whooping cough, and they suffered its full ravages. By 1939, over 4,000 Grand Rapids children had received the vaccine. Now, during the first three decades of the 20th century, many American cities hosted vaccine trials. Grand Rapids was not alone. While historians have done a, much studying vaccine development and the reception or rejection of biological products, They've studied the infamous trials at Willowbrook where children were injected with hepatitis. They've studied the famous polio vaccine trials. David Oshinsky's uh, book is, is in there. But local work, the actual on the ground, how you do the study, that's not been studied so much. It's gotten far less attention. We know from the pages of the American Journal of Public Health that James Duell in Cleveland received Rockefeller funding as well as local dollars to conduct his studies. He had support from local clinics and nurses and Case Western Reserve epidemiologists, actually called Western Reserve University then. From January of 39 to November of 1940, Binghamton, New York also hosted a controlled study of Kendrick and Eldering's vaccine um, in which children attending the city's well baby clinics received the vaccines. They received follow-up visits from the State Dep Division of Public Health and Nursing, and all cases of the disease were not only investigated by the City Health Department, but confirmed by State Department of Health Communicable Disease Epidemiologists. While Binghamton, um, the Binghamton study shares much, including the antigen, with the Grand Rapids and Cleveland studies, New York's um, State's Department of Health study relied much more on state rather than local imp personnel. Kendrick and Eldering's work makes clear that the community side of vaccine studies offers a fruitful, if much understudied, field of how science operates at the local level, and if local personnel would be increasingly pushed to the side by state personnel, as was the case in welfare reform. Now, by the 1920s, most states had a Department of Health and laboratory services in place. And while many cities have municipal health departments by the 20s, and historians have studied those quite widely, the interwar years were a time in which state public health authorities are struggling to carve out a niche for themselves. Where do they fit? We don't have a National Board of Health. Many are arguing for that at the time. And in the pages of the American Journal of Public Health, you see a lot of articles like the relative functions of state and local health departments, which warn that over-centralized work, i.e. in the State Department, would undermine local initiatives. The State Department, they argued, should focus on promoting research, standardizing records, and taking care of coordinating local groups. They should stay out of the local affairs. Barbara Rosencrantz has done a wonderful study of the Massachusetts State Board of Health, and that's about it. There's a little bit on the Louisiana State Board of Health where it intersects with yellow fever epidemics. But for the most part, nobody has studied these boards of health. Comparative studies are non-existent. 
If you examine the Department of Health records from Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, New York, and Wisconsin between 1920 and 1940, you'll see that these state departments shared a common vision of public health, comparable health administrative structures, a commitment to hiring talented men and women at all levels of the bureaucracy. Women were not at the very top, but they're just about at the top in many places. These states formed common administrative structures. Um, they basically are all aiming to support federal commitments to protecting humans as a resource and to preventing interstate epidemics. You see um, a lot of maternal child health programs, rural health programs, communicable disease outreach, and in addition to labs and engineering, you also in some states have separate departments of TB or venereal disease. Kendrick and Eldering's successful development and field testing of a pertussis vaccine offers an instructive case study for examining innovative research performed in state health department laboratories during the interwar years. Historians, because of paper trails and because of fame, tend to focus on university research, research institutes, federal laboratories, which are quite well, were better funded, and even drug companies. But the work of Kendrick and Eldring shows that adding state health department laboratories to the mix broadens our understanding of who is, of who is involved in scientific research, where science studies occurred, and just the scope of public health work in the state health department. State health department scientists, often women, worked away from the venues where scientists tended to receive larger scale funding and left, as I said, the larger paper trails. Margaret Rossiter's extensive two-volume Women Scientists in America, Struggles and Strategies to 1940, and then her second volume, which goes to 1972, called Before Affirmative Action, stresses that while some women conducted important bacteriology research in the state health department laboratories and got promotions, bacteriolo bacteriology at the state level, she argues, was highly feminized and characterized by low salaries. And if you look in the AJPH, the Journal of Public Health, they have all of these job ads specifically for women bacteriologists. And if you compare them to the ones for the male bacteriologists, they're getting about a third less in salary. Um, indeed, state health department scientists and national public health spokesmen repeatedly complained that low wages kept good men from taking jobs. And I got to interview one of the public health scientists who worked with um, Grace Eldering, and he complained that she was a nun to science and she wouldn't raise their wages because she was more interested in funding the research and how could she do this to them. Now, despite the excitement about their, um, their vaccine, Kendrick and Eldering faced a lot of skepticism. How could relatively unknown scientists working away from the major research centers achieve such success, while better funded, more advanced laboratories had failed? As former head of the CDC, uh, David Sensor noted, only after the Medical Research Council in London confirmed their results were they believed. What he left out of that is they were part of that confirmation process, and he was a very good friend of theirs. Shortly after they announced their vaccine, prominent Cleveland epidemiologist James Duell reported that his vaccine, when he did a study, offered no protection. And both Kendrick and Duell are on the American Public Health Association's committee on whooping cough. So they call in the head of the American Public Health Association, a man by the name of, um, of, um, of Frost. And what they do is they say to him, okay, this is Wade Hampton Frost, please help sort this out. Well, Frost is, is looking to find fault with Kendrick's study. And he notes in a personal note to George Ramsey, who headed communicable disease research in New York at the State Health Department, that he really suspected that Kendrick's vaccine wouldn't work because not one in 50 vaccine studies such worked. And Kendrick had been at Johns Hopkins and had studied with Frost and others. Frost says, okay, you know, Kendrick will check out your studies, but he, secretly he's writing to Ramsey, please get in on this with me so you can share the odium with me when I tell them that really it didn't work after all. Well, unable to find the faults he sought, Frost would journey not once but twice to Grand Rapids to examine Kendr Kendrick and Eldering's data. And then he concludes that, well, it really did work quite well, and he proposes additional studies, 
We don't know what else he would have done with them. He dies shortly after he proposes the additional studies. Kendrick's laboratory then gives the formula for producing pertussis vaccine over to the state biologicals group. Um, and by 1940, the vaccine from Michigan is widely distributed across the nation. The American Academy of Pediatrics approves the vaccine for routine use in 1943. The AMA recommends it in 1944. And in 1948, in the textbook of bacteriology, Kendrick and Eldering are cited as the authority of why vaccination for whooping cough should be done. During these years, the Michigan Department of Health enjoyed an international reputation for research and outreach that attracted the attention of health authorities from around the world. And Michigan was not alone. State to health departments from across the Northeast and Midwest supported this kind of research, um, delegating some of the routine analysis to other places, allowing after hours use of facilities, taking New Deal grants and putting them into public health laboratory facilities. And these state laboratories will not only improve diagnostic tests, but also create, conduct groundbreaking trials of various biological products and contribute even to the basic understanding of bacteriology, virology, and immunology. Now, when I first heard Kendrick and Eldring's story, I was told that they were really marginalized scientists. No one believed them. No one recognized them. And what I've realized as I've worked with them is that they're actually at the heart of the scientific enterprise. They're, Kendrick is on important boards at the American Public Health Association. She, is, she goes all over the world with the World Health Organization organizing vaccine trials. She is working with uh, various UN agencies uh, um, very, very well known. But why do we know Jonas Salk's name and Albert Sabin and not Pearl Kendrick? Well, some of it is personality. In 1970, Pearl Kendrick and Grace Eldring were invited to appear on national TV on the Today Show. And they said, no, thank you. We're really pretty embarrassed by all of this publicity. We don't want it. And that was the kind of person they were. They got recognition in the scientific community. But beyond that, they were just glad they had saved the lives of thousands of children. It was who they were. But if you, similar to the problem of stressing the marginality of Kendrick and Eldering, stressing the marginality of state health departments by focusing on salaries, promotions, uh, credit, career paths, it deflects the, way, the um, attention away from the ways that scientists at health department laboratories really were plugged in and that women really had, while not the ability to rise to the very top, those are almost those are exclusively reserved for men. They can be associate directors. Um, New York has this, Michigan, and others. Women directed divisions of child hygiene, public health, nursing, education, and hospitals, and they stayed in these positions for a good long time. Now, some people will say these are feminized fields. Bacteriology and nursing certainly are feminized fields. But on the other hand, these women were widely recognized for their talents. Scientists employed in state health departments, therefore, were visible, active, and valued members of the international, not just local, public health communities. Indeed, Cy Young, the director of the Michigan Department of Health, not the pitcher, um, ran the American Journal of Public Health Laboratory section for many years. Kendrick and Eldering hosted scientists from around the world on their porch in Grand Rapids. They were well known for their flower and vegetable gardens. A couple of examples of this high flyer science. 1928, the New York Department of Health bacteriologists offered not only presentations at the annual meeting of the pathologists, the bacteriologists, the immunologists, and the public health and medical conferences. They also published their results in the Journal of Infectious Diseases and the Journal of Bacteriology and published a chapter on newer knowledge in the leading Jordan and Falk textbook. Illinois has a similar record with their scientists publishing wild, um, widely in the Journal of Public Health, but also the Journal of Bacteriology and the Archives of Internal Medicine. The Rockefellers throw a lot of money at state laboratories, um, the ones I've mentioned, but also in Alabama as well, and across the South to deal with hookworm. 
And finally, and this will lead into the last part of the paper, state health department scientists coordinated standard methods efforts with universities, pharmaceutical companies, medical schools, and universities to make testing more accurate and more consistent. Now, in her article, A Need for Standard Methods, Patricia Peck Gossel details the way that critical staffing shortages in bacteriology at the turn of the century created a drive to streamline routine work and devise time-saving methods to keep up with the rapidly rising workload. Early on, she notes, state boards of health contracted with universities and medical schools to meet the demand for analyses. Standard methods allowed you to shift this routine work onto technicians. The search for standard methods led to the formation of the laboratory section of the American Public Health Association and professional bacteriology societies. But beyond Gossel's study, historical analysis of standard methods has been fairly limited. Most historians have seen it as boring, routine, marginalized, and not really scientific. There is a very good study out on standardizing the unit of insulin and a couple of other things, but for the most part, no. The scientific community and historians of science have long preferred to study groundbreaking research, the vaccine trials, for example. This bias in topic selection renders invisible the content of studies classed as routine or standard, mind-numbing work, suitable for women. Historians have responded in a strange way. Naomi Oreskes, for example, argued that these women are all doing good objective science, and it's undervalued because it doesn't meet the male ideals of hero heroic science done late at night in a lab or field while facing great danger. Oreskes said, the stuff the men were doing wasn't so dangerous either. So the women were objective, the men weren't so heroic. Therefore, these women weren't doing routine science, they were doing good science. But in shifting the women scientists' image from drudge to objective scientists, Oreskes and others have distanced their historical subjects from the marginalized scientists conducting the large volumes of routine analysis in State Board of Health laboratories. In her study, A Midwife's Tale, historian Laurel Ulrich re reconstructs the life and work of a midwife and the life of her town um, from this midwife's 28-year-long diary. Other historians had dismissed the diary. There are interesting parts, but it was filled with trivia, washed, cleaned, cooked, shelled peas, the like. But Ulrich found stories in the trivia. Her methods offer historians of science and medicine access to the ways that routine analysis nurtured and furthered paradigm-shifting innovations. During the interwar years, State Department of Health administrators repeatedly expressed a commitment to having their employees, many of whom now actually had bacteriology training, had them conduct research on, and I quote, problems that arise in the course of routine analysis. What becomes clear from the department records of the state laboratory is that these scientists, men and women alike, were engaged in research on standard methods, what Thomas Kuhn has called normal science rather than paradigm shifts. These scientists were not automatons. Rather, they were scientists actively and consciously engaged in developing standards to make routine analysis and biologicals production more accurate, more efficient, and more cost effective so that more lives could be saved. Thomas Hull, director of the Illinois Laboratories, noted that while the rapid increase in the number of samples for routine testing prevented the establishment of a dedicated research division, various members of his staff were undertaking the study of problems that directly affected their work in the time permitted. He then noted that as time permits, each member of the division is urged to undertake problems lying within the scope of his routine work. Michigan is similar. Um, Cy Young stressed that they should make maximum, they should um, make this laboratory of maximum value to the physician, and the staff is encouraged at all times to carry on research work, special investigations of problems that arise, um, especially on special problems that arise in the course of routine work. And Young is actually repeatedly sending his scientists out to Johns Hopkins for training, to University of Michigan for training. So this isn't just routine work. It's routine work done with an eye to making routine work better. Such work produced better growth media, standard methods for bacterial isolation, standard um, 
and more efficient productions of vaccines, antitoxins, and other biologicals. New York even publishes a standard methods manual that would find wide use in the United States. Um, when the second edition came out, um, the director of the Wisconsin lab said, this work is the only comprehensive American publication in book form dealing entirely with the public health laboratory techniques and covering the field adequately. It is a valuable reference book. Where do they put their efforts for f devising standards? Well, one is in syphilis analyses. To control syphilis, state scientists wanted to figure out, A, the best way to do a Wasserman test, and then eventually in the Michigan labs, Reuben Kahn, working with Pearl Kendrick and a group of others, fi figure out that the Kahn test is actually an even better assay for determining whether someone has syphilis. And with syphilis, given the social stigma associated with the disease and the dangers of not catching the disease, you had to get it right. As Health Commissioner Olin noted after that the contest proved an economic, um, the savings done by replacing the, the Wasserman with the contest proved to be an economic consideration of no small importance. Similarly, the states would try to standardize biologicals production, uh, the production of vaccines, antitoxin, various sera. Research would allow greater cost savings. In 1926, Michigan's Department of Health found that it could produce a more affordable product than the commercial houses for the state. And the biological division actually becomes so good at producing the product and so good at purchasing the, um, the antecedents that they actually start to realize substantial returns on the production and turn a profit. In 1930, Cy Young noted that while Michigan produced biological products, quote, cheaper than any other laboratory, either governmental or commercial, the biological products had brought the state over $48,000 in profit, sustaining both itself and the entire cost of running the diagnostic laboratories. Illinois did similar tests and figured out how to save over $97,000 a year by producing their own biologicals because biological products were often distributed free by the states during this time period. You want to get rid of some. Uh, you want to get rid of diphtheria, tetanus, eventually whooping cough. You need to pay for it because people can't. Most people have no medical insurance during this time. They also want to coordinate the standardized sera with clinical observations. Does this really work, and how can we tell? Standard methods are really important. Now today, if you work in a laboratory, which I got to do when I was in graduate school, and you want to make an agar medium, you take agar powder and you dump it in a dish and add some water and there's an appropriate stirring technique. You want to make sure you only grow a certain kind of E. coli and not another. You add various antibiotics and stir, mix, and you've got a plate. Not so in the 1920s and 30s. There are no off-the-shelf media or diagnostic plates. Culturing the bacillus itself was tedious and expensive because you had to keep checking the plates and making sure hardier organisms didn't overrun the tiny pertussis colonies. But you also had to make a medium. In this case, they decided to use sheep's blood, which sometimes the scientists themselves, Grace Eldering was from a Montana farm, she had to go out, they had to go out and get blood samples from the sheep to make their media. That takes a lot of study. You want a potato bullion medium, you're boiling potatoes. You're not just reaching off the shelf. So efficiency here and standard methods are important. Finally, one of the questions is, how long do you keep a child in quarantine? Now, back then, parents who had to not go to work, and many, many parents didn't work, mothers didn't work outside the home, but when there's not, two breadwinners or when there's not someone to watch your children, who watches the child while they're in a three to four week isolation period? This is a major problem because there also was no standard for doing this. Chicago had a two week quarantine and then for three work weeks you could, for the f next week or so you had to wear a yellow armband that said whooping cough and you could walk in the street with a nurse. Michigan had a three week period of isolation. Um, and finally, Kendrick and Eldering studies the cough plates they developed, the better media, the better growth um, 
protocols allowed them to say, no, by the fourth week, most child children are not infectious anymore, and we can do release plates. In other words, if you have two consecutive release plates that are clear of pertussis, then you can go back to school. Otherwise, we're not going to let you spread this disease. Kendrick happily reported in 1935 that the cough plate technique has become a routine procedure in the laboratory, accepted by the Grand Rapids Health Department as an aid to diagnosis and under study as a basis for relief. Without the standard methods for media, sample collection, culturing, confirming cases, the larger vaccine study would have been far more difficult, far less consistent. Solving routine problems facilitates groundbreaking studies. It's not drudgery, it's groundwork. State health departments deliberately carved out a niche for themselves in the interwar years. As federal money became increasingly available after World War II, these state departments would position themselves so as to get the maximum share of federal dollars they could. They would struggle to maintain their research and outreach niches in a world where increasingly they would have to compete with funds for, with, um, compete with national laboratories in the CDC, the expanding NIH, bigger universities, private laboratories, and an alphabet soup of state and local state and federal agencies. Still, the work of scientists like Kendrick and Eldring and state health department laboratories during the interwar years suggests that there's rich historical territory that can be fruitfully mined in our efforts to understand the process by which science was supported, the venues in which research flourished, and an understanding of the very real value of mu the mundane and the routine. Thank you very much. Now, I'd be glad to take questions, and I'm told that I need to put on this kind of microphone and take this microphone and hand it around. So. Wait till she's out. Okay, uh, our women's studies class did some research on these two scientists. One of the things that they found was that there, were ver there was very little information available. They got very upset about it. And so I'm wondering, um, where would one find more information on Kendrick and Eldring? Not simply biology, but their methods, and where would there be um, research such as yours which would explore their influence on others later? Okay, sorry. I guess so, yeah. But that's one of the places. Um, Grand Rapids City Archives is another place. Grand Rapids Public Library, I'm sure you've worked with there. Um, but also their publications are everywhere. The American Journal of Public Health, their archives are now online. Um, and they've published widely there. Um, Grace Eldering's papers are in the state library. Um, plus, in the University of Michigan archives, Kendrick had a very, very wide correspondence. Um, so there's, there's a lot of material out there. I, actually, there, I have an article that I published in the Michigan um, uh, Journal of Michigan History just a year or so ago as well, um, but which is on the community aspects. Um, also, at, um, in Bethesda, uh, Kendrick's work with Margaret Pittman, <coughs> excuse me, and standardizing studies is also available. Were you able to find anything about their personal lives? They were very private people. Um, they shared a home on the northwest side. They were best of friends 
from their own work, I've managed to piece together their lives. Uh, Kendrick was born in Illinois, moved to upstate New York with her father, who is a preacher for the Free Methodist Church. I spent some time working with materials from the Free Methodist Archives to get a bit of her ideology. Starts out as a teacher and then works and then decides, I love teaching, but I want to research. And so she goes to New York Department of Health and then to Grand Ra first to Lansing and then eventually to Grand Rapids. Grace Eldering majors in English and I believe it's biology out at the University of Montana and then gets on a train and says, I'm coming out here. And she goes to Lansing, then to Grand Rapids. Um, I have spent some time talking to Grace Eldering's family members. So that's one source. And the woman who was a caregiver for Grace Eldering later in life. Uh, Loni Clinton Gordon, I was told there's an exhibit uh, up with her work as well who worked in their laboratory. I got to interview her um, late in her life. Um, all these bacteriologists were all not only good at growing things in the lab, but they're also very good at growing gardens and also very good at cooking. Um, so I got to s sit down and have a meal with her. Um, so there's, a, there's some material. One of the questions I'm always asked is, they shared a house, so what else did they share? Um, they shared a life, but um, I, had, I finally asked this question of the women who knew them. And finally, one Dr. Lucille Portwood, who is over at Michigan State, I finally asked her, and she, 80 years old, quite deaf, screams into my tape recorder that I'm 80 years, you know, I'm a lesbian, and I would have known if those gals were up to something. So, so from basically what I was told is women of that generation, the salaries are low in public health. The salaries are low in teaching. You shared a home because otherwise you wouldn't get to live someplace quite so nice. And it was company. They weren't getting married. Um, that's not what their interest was. If, if they had decided to go and have children um, and have a different kind of a life, they wouldn't have been able to go to the lab all evening. And so they made choices. Thanks. Um. Just sort of a, a simple question, I guess. Is it plausible, you mentioned how she turned down interviews with uh, the Today Show. Mm -hmm. Had she done that interview, <clears throat> could it have helped generate revenue to further her research? And does she, you wonder if she had any <clears throat> regrets about how that could have pioneered other women into those types of studies, or was she just happy n being in the background? Well, Gr um, Pro Kendrick and Grace Eldering were, <sighs> I've never met them, but they were not the kind of people who, by 1970, when these interviews are coming up in light of the women's movement, they're happy to support people around the back, but they're not out there in front grandstanding. It's just a different world. They're not in the lobbying for public health in those ways. That's not who they were. Um, the women who worked in their lab, Loni Gordon, said they supported you to the utmost in getting your work done, learning everything. Um, they supported women across racial lines. And so if you look at their laboratory, they had both men and women working there. But they're not out in front kind of people. That's a different generation. Um, Pearl Kendrick was, would yell at you if you were not wearing your gloves and your hat in the post office, I was told. But you needed to be, a woman should dress pro properly. It's a different, it's a very different generation. So, thank you. You said the uh, quarantine time was four weeks. I was just interested if uh, any of the research ever led to a shorter isolation period. Actually, that's an interesting question. What they found is, they, I, I don't have the figures with me now, but that a certain percentage of children were clear by this week, but four weeks was the time period by which you could pretty much, it was, I think, over 90% were clear by that, and then you needed two release cough plates consecutive release cough plates to make sure you were tr truly clear because this disease was incredibly contagious. Um, so, yeah. I was wondering if you'd be willing to share your personal story with us. I wonder uh, how you got interested in this field as a historian? In Kendrick and Eldring? Um, actually, the way I got interested, that's a really interesting question. Um, my, my dissertation was on Chicago sewage. It has nothing to do with Pearl Kendrick and Grace Eldering. It's actually an earlier <laughs> period, and you don't get to give many after-dinner talks when you do sewage. I was looking for a new topic. I had said what I needed to say about Chicago sewage, and so I was done with it. And 
people in Grand Rapids kept telling me I needed to work on these women. And they were fascinating women with a wonderful story, and um, their records were local for the most part. And that fit with my life. Um, I think sometimes you're drawn to historical characters, and I won't compare my work to theirs because they saved many lives, but you find people who are sympathetic, um, and you, you kind of, um, I love the way that they did their work. <coughs> they got credit in the scientific community, and that was what mattered. What mattered to them more than the, any credit the scientific community could have given them, however, were the lives they saved, the lives they touched. And even later in life, um, one of their efforts had been, once they got the whooping cough vaccine down, how do you combine antigens to make what we call the DTA, the DTP, which today now it's a cellular pertussis. But Pearl Kendrick said these poor little pin cushions, we're being able, we're, we can prevent more and more diseases, but these kids are pin cushions. We can't keep sticking them. How do we combine antigens? It was about the lives they could save, the suffering they could prevent. And I just, I've always found that really interesting about them. So they're good characters. Um, I wanted to know what their names are again. You keep saying it, and I'm like getting confused about okay. exactly the Pearl names Pearl Kendrick, P E A R L K E N D R I C K, and then Grace Eldering, E L D E R I N G. My New York, <laughs> I'm New York in it. <laughs> well, does anyone else have a question? Having done this research, do you um, do you support vaccines? Then obviously, I am, I'm an absolute supporter of vaccines. I won't say all vaccines are perfect. And there are adverse vaccine events. Um, it's a question of um, the good of the one, which actually it can protect your own child. But it also, if you have something called herd immunity, it protects large scale. Um, it protects the children around you as well. Um, it protects those who are immune compromised and cannot get vaccines. Having said that, there are children who uh, did have adverse reactions to the pertussis vaccine, not specifically Kendrick and Eldrings. I think they had one vaccine event that went awry. Other labs had more. And serious, the pertussis antigen, until they went to the acellular pertussis, there were children who had convulsions um, and some children who were hurt badly. But those cases and, um, become more stark when the disease goes away. And we tend to forget that whooping cough killed large, large numbers of children. Uh, six per 100,000, I believe it was, um, about the same as scarlet fever did. Uh, diphtheria, 25 per 100,000. Um, so in light of, you know, when we don't see the disease in our midst, we tend to forget how terrible these diseases were. Um, my fourth grade teacher actually had whooping cough. And I remember there are things that stick in your head from fourth grade where she described what it was like to be nine years old and having to learn how to walk again because she had been so sick. So yes, I support vaccines, but I also realize that there are problems. So we have to make better vaccines. I just have one. Um, I was struck by the, the difference in the way that the money that was made from the creation of the vaccine went back to the state, which then was able to put the money back into mm -hmm. their programs, making them better for mm -hmm. public health, yeah. as opposed to models that we have now with um, corporate entities um, and pharmaceutical houses and so on. Well, How did that, did, did that transition happen while these women were alive or was that not going on then? Okay, the bad, the bad mean vaccine companies, um, we have to kind of remember that Pearl Kendrick and Grace Eldrin were working with, laterly, Wyda, Wyda, um, Upchon. These guys are all part of the same scientific community. Um, the state is making a profit, and it's putting it back into funding state things, but it is making a profit. Mm -hmm. 
they're doing some research, but the vaccine houses are doing other research. And the state of Michigan can't supply the whole nation. Mm -hmm. So, um, what? You need a delivery system. You need to get people doing the research. Um, I think vex I think that one of the reasons there is not a lot of more vaccine research and a lot of companies have pulled out of the vaccine business is because of the high liability following the polio trials where there were some very serious errors made, what's called the Cutter incident. The court system established a precedent whereby you could sue for damages and for net, even you could sue for, um, how'd they put it? Even if you had not been negligent and you had followed all of the government's procedures, you could still be sued for damages. A lot of companies just said, we're not going to make these anymore. We don't make a profit. They don't make much profit. Vaccines are very, very low profit, um, except for the sort of, you, you hear a lot about the newer ones, um, the HPV, but for the most part, they're low profit. So if it's low profit, high exposure and liability, why make them? So, yeah, it's a, it's a complicated business because who is going to fund it? So, yeah. Okay, well, I want to thank you again for Thanks. for speaking to us tonight and, and kicking off this great uh, celebration of ours. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>